Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome again to RCN 2022. So it's a great pleasure to uh, have Professor Mirwan Deba as keynote speaker. So Mirwan Deba is the chief researcher at the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi. And he is professor at both Central CPLEC in France and with the Department of Machine Learning at the uh, Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence. Um, he worked in several labs like Motorola Labs uh, and Vienna Research Center for Telecommunications in Australia. Uh, he was also the director of the El Catal Lucent's Chair on Flexible Radio. And from 2014 to 2021, he was the vice president of the Huawei France Research Center. He was jointly the director of the Mathematical and Algorithmic Science Labs, as well as the director of the Lagrange Mathematical and Computing Research Center. Since 2021, he is the leading uh, of the Artificial Intelligence Digital Science Research Centers at the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Marwan Daba is an IEEE fellow, uh, a WWLF fellow, and Orazi Fellow, and uh, Institute Lewis Bashuri Fellow, and the member Emirate um, also. So, Marwan Deba received several prizes, uh, like Mario Bola Award, the IEEE Glavius Prize, and the Qualcomm Innovation Prize Award. And the uh, 2019 IEEE Radio Communications Committee Technical Regulation Award and the Blondel Middle Awards. So um, from 2021 to uh, 2022, Merwan Deba serves as an IEEE Signal Processing Society Distinguished and Distressed Speaker. So uh, the, the title of his presentation today is about 10 scientific challenges for, six, for 6G. Uh, please uh, join me to uh, welcome Merwan Deba. Okay, so first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm quite sorry I could not make it uh, physically. I know that now things are much more open to travel, but uh, uh, I could not make it. But I hope uh, we'll spend uh, the next 45 minutes uh, uh, all together and, and we exchanging the ideas on what I think are the important things we should do around the topic of 6G. So my name is Mirwan Deba, and before I start, I have just two slides to introduce basically the institution. Uh, to which I belong. Uh, uh, I belong to the institution called Technology Innovation Institute, which is a new type of applied research center that is being built here in the Middle East. I came here to build what we call the AI and Digital Science Research Center. And the goal, of course, is to build what we call this transformation in which uh, Abu Dhabi is going through and more generally the UAE from what we call an oil-based economy and knowledge-based economy. Towards that, we identified a couple of what we call priority sectors on which we thought was quite important for the UAE to be very present. And these, of course, were translated into 10 centers that we have built so far. Today, we're roughly 650 people doing only research. Uh, and you have here the main topics on which we have a high interest. And this goes from advanced materials, autonomous robotics, cryptography, directed energy propulsion, secure systems, quantum systems. We built the first quantum computer here in the Middle East. Uh, one year ago, with I mean, when you talk about quantum computer, we're talking about a couple of qubits. Alternative and renewable energy, biotech, and also AI and digital science. And we built also the largest, big, the most, the biggest uh, model in the world in Arabic, which was called Noor. And my team worked intensively on doing that. Let's start now on the talk. So uh, the the topic is quite interesting today because I think many of you are now jumping in the field of communication and computing and especially trying basically to work on a big topic which is beyond 5G and 6G. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on explaining what is 6G and I think you have a lot of talks within this conference showcasing you what are the KPIs, what we're aiming. Here my main goal is to go back to the roots and ask some fundamental questions about what are basically the basic principles on which basically we need to work on? And especially, I know there's a lot of PhDs, postdocs working here, and also students, and on which basically we should invest in our time, interestingly. When we go back in history, we have what we call basically uh, landmark papers or landmark books 
or landmark disciplines, which have basically been at the heart of all the engineering we've been doing this uh, more than 100 years ago. The Nyquist sampling theorem, for all of you, dates from 1924. Shannon's law, 1948. Von Neumann architecture, 1946. Moore's law, 1965. Wiener's linear signal processing basics, 1948. And many other uh, things happened also during that time. Uh, and uh, game theory, for example. And from that time, I would say most of the work that we've been doing is trying to engineer those concepts and build up basically the algorithms which achieve those limits. If you look at coding, for example, with Shannon's law, the majority of the coding principles, at least those which achieve basically the Shannon limit, were in the 90s. You go back to turbo codes, LDPC codes, and different variants. And today we feel that the whole community is lacking some basic principles on where basically they could work for another decade or even a hundred years of, I would say, progress in terms of engineering those concepts and achieving those limits. And my talk is basically about discussing how we could, or some of you, come up with these landmark papers to help the whole community and also the whole society in terms of building the engineering concept to achieve new limits. Of course, when you look at what people are putting up as six, six G KPIs, the first question that you need to ask yourself is, are those KPIs from a fundamental principle achievable? And then of course you can work on the algorithms. And I think we're lacking at this moment this guidance of going from six G to seven G and more in terms of what are the fundamental limits that we're aiming, which will, of course will give us the algorithmic features to achieve those kind of limits. Now, the big question is, if you want to build those guiding principles, you have to ask yourself, what has changed today with respect to 100 years ago? So going back on what has changed, at least on the communication paradigm, I could talk about also the communication paradigm, which is extremely important at the moment, because as you know, uh, 6G is more or less some kind of, of combination of communication and computing. The first thing that is striking today is that when we did communication, more than a century ago, we were uh, designing models. And those models were basically based on the fact that we had a transmitter and receiver. And the environment was considered as an independent entity. It was in, and in the sense is that basically you could achieve only what the environment could give you. Of course, we knew that if the environment could change, that we could, of course, attain or achieve other limits. Today, we have a lot of new technologies which are appearing here and there where we can control the environment and where the environment is not an independent entity anymore. And where we could, of course, push the limits much harder or much farther just by changing in a digital way the environment. Of course, we always know that when you make a call from one person to the other person and the communication link is not good, in general, you move. And when you move, basically, you do physical movement to change the environment in which you're communicating to increase, basically, the kind of rate that you want. But today, there's a lot of bunch of technologies like smart environment, ultra-massive, mindful, large intelligence surfaces which enable you, of course, to come up with an environment which is controllable and in which you basically, instead of having destructive interference, you're getting constructive interference. Second big, I would say, game changer that we're seeing today is that uh, we have, and something that was not put forward by Shannon, the fact that memory is there and the memory cost is going down. So we can store, when we do a communication, all the past that we did. We could also basically have the ability to compute out of that kind of memory and the data that we have models that could be used. And so we're coming up with a system where we're not meaning, meaning anymore on exchanging data from one point to the other point, but exchanging what we have learned from one point to the other point. What we want to exchange anymore is not data, but we want to exchange the models. And this is, of course, giving new features for all the 6G real where we're trying to connect intelligence and not connect data or people anymore. And I think this is a big game changer because by storing the past, extracting some models, the way you communicate change fundamentally with new compression rates that appear and many other features that were not there before. The third thing also which is happening is the fact that we're attaining higher and higher frequencies in the way we communicate. And the classical aim of communicating was basically trying to solve Maxwell equations in what we call the far field approximation, exponential j omega t minus chi r, if you want to be simple. 
We did that because, of course, the equations were hard to solve, and we were always going at what we call the far field approximation. But there's no reason to go over towards that. We know that if we solve the Maxwell equation, then we get what we call modes. And in fact, we always knew that one way of communicating information was not to use space, time, frequency, but use what we call the mode feature. Today, thanks to the available computing power, we know that we can exploit those modes to communicate the information from one point to the other with a lot of features in terms of reducing the complexity of our system and how we design the system. And this goes, of course, from what we call orbital angular momentum, Bessel beams, holographic MIMO, and other features which are related also to what I call here the thermodynamics of communications. So I think this is a very important feature that uh, is happening today. And also with also the big change in how we think on how to design the system. Usually when you went to higher frequencies, people were trying to push the limits of RF to achieve more and more basically performance to be able to, trans to transmit towards those uh, type of frequencies. And there's a big game changer today when saying, well, if we're going up, up, we're achieving what we call optical. And why not use all the optical techniques that we know, optical ADCs, stuff like that, to be able to solve the problem of our and this is also a big game changer that we're seeing in the realm of how we communicate today. And we're moving from what I call a massive MIMO regime to a massive mode regime. The last one also, which goes back to Wiener, is the fact that we have nonlinearities everywhere in our communication systems, everywhere. Today, it's even more than before, because basically we're pushing the system into much farther limits, especially with the frequencies we're having. We have nonlinear amplifiers, which are going in the nonlinear regime. We have basically end-to-end -end systems, which are nonlinear, and it's only the channel which is nonlinear. PAPR, for example, in OFDM is a nonlinear. Now, for communication engineers, what they did before, they were trying to go back in their comfort zones. Whenever you have nonlinearities, what you do is what we call a backup, a power backup, or what I can wear a backup, to go in. We know that that backup costs you a lot. It costs you a lot, basically, especially in terms of energy and power. However, we did that because we never knew how to solve nonlinear systems. But today we have a branch in mathematics and tools which enable us to solve the problem of nonlinear systems. Of course, AI is one where a lot of people who are working on what we call the auto encoder approach are doing that. But we have also sparse communication, non current communication, nonlinear signal processing theory which is enabling us with new tools to solve this problem of nonlinearities and be able, of course, to exploit the system to its maximum and find what are the optimal type of waveforms, which are eigenmodes of these nonlinear systems. So I think these four, I would say, issues have changed a lot these last years on how we think about communication and provide also a realm of opportunities. So what are the opportunities that we're seeing? Well, I have listed them, them here. And for me, they are unsolved problems. And uh, I've been claiming this already in a talk that I gave a couple of months ago in ICC. I'm gonna insist on some of the things that on which we have moved forward. And what I'm saying here is that I think the disciplines that I'm listing here will have a huge impact for the people who are building such systems. I'm gonna go one by one, maybe not in detail for each one for the time I have, but at least we'll give you what is the status at the moment and what needs to be done to solve basically, I would say, the challenges. It's not necessarily the technologies and the technologies you can see them on the side in terms of impact. And at the end, I'll talk about what are the buzzwords related to those, I would say, key scientific challenges. So the first one is what I call electromagnetic information theory. So what is electromagnetic information theory is of course the reunion or the fusion of a disciplines related to Electromagnetics, another one related to information theory. It's not the first time that people have been trying to merge two disciplines. And of course, one of the reasons you want to do that is to look at the problem differently. But not necessarily by looking at the problem differently. You also find some solutions. I can give you a very specific example. When people are trying to merge what we call the Wiener and Shannon, when Shannon meets Wiener or when Wiener meets Shannon, we solved by merging these two communities and finding a relation between what we call the mutual information and the MMSC, the minimum mean square, for people who are familiar with that, a way to solve a very fundamental problem of water feeling. I think you're all familiar with water feeling. 
where basically Shannon devised a way to maximize the capacity on the channel by telling you that you should take your channel, cut it into subbands, and on each subband, do what we call the water filling formula. However, that is good for Gaussian signals. At the end, in general, when you transmit, you don't have Gaussian signals. You have basically what we call QPSK quants types of signals. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what is the kind of water filling formula I need to do when I have constraints on the kind of constellation that I transmit? Because they're not Gaussian. That's a hard problem because you're trying to maximize your mutual information and trying to find what is the power allocation you need to do. That was a hard problem. But when we were able to merge these two communities, which is a signal processing community and an information theory community, by finding this magic formula, which relates to what we call the mutual information with the mean, mean square, we were able to solve that problem and came up with what we call the mercury water filling formula. I encourage you to look at those papers. And there, we had nearly 3 dB gains, and we had a very nice formulation on how to solve it. So what I mean by that is that the notion of com combination of two communities enables you to solve some problems which are unsolved. However, we don't do it just for that. Why we're doing it today, why we're doing it today mostly because for people, they were taking the channel as an entity which was linear without taking basically the transmitter and receiver and the fact that the environment could have an impact on the way we communicate. Of course, the first guy who said that is Gabor uh, in 1953. And of issued already some recommendation saying, hey guys, there's an issue with the paper of Shannon. There's something that he didn't take into account is that physics is very important. And of course, physics is very important in the sense that when you look at the problem, well, you need to change and look at how physics is looking at the problem. And of course, that led to a couple of, of people trying to solve uh, this uh, in electromagnetic information theory for many years. Just like the number of papers that I'm showing you here of people trying to merge into disciplines, but without so much success. The success was made in these last years, and it was most, mostly made by the fact that people understood that by taking more into account the physics, we could find basic new opportunities in terms of transmission. And this, I put it in the classical beam of what I call here holographic communication. And let me give you just one example on why, when you look at the details of electromagnetic in fact, and today we have the computing power to do it, things change. There's a common understanding in the community of MIMO for people who are listening to me here, that whenever you have line of sight, then your channel matrix that represents the input output relation has rank one. And line of sight was something very bad for many years for MIMO systems. Why? Because if you have a rank one system and you solve the log dead formula, which is quite known, then you get what we call a multiplexing gain of one. So you get, of course, an energy gain, but basically you get a multiplexing gain of one. And the main reason that was happening is because we were taking, of course, what we call the planner approximation, the far field approximation. However, when you look at the details, and today, thanks to the kind of bands and antennas that we're using, things are fundamentally changing in how you're looking at the electromagnetics of that effect. And if I start applying my information theory background and looking at what we call the degrees of freedom, I end up not with the degrees of freedom of one, as I showed you before, but a degrees of freedom of four. If basically you take a certain lambda, which is 0 .0 0 0.1 meter, and we can go up to a degrees of 40 when you start taking the real kind of, of transmission schemes and electromagnetic effect, which are here what we call spherical waves. And of course, the realm of frequency that we're using, because the fact that you're what we call far field and near field, by the way, is not something independent from the frequency, is something happening right now for everybody which is working on limited wave and terahertz communication in some sense. So it's changing totally the paradigm, and it's changing even more the paradigm because of the antennas that we're using. I strongly encourage you to spend some time going to our sister societies. One of them is what we call the IEEE transactions on antennas and propagations. And they are the plethora of new devices that they're inventing are enabling us, of course, to have much more greater opportunities in terms of what we can communicate and transmit. And you can here see the kind of antennas which are appearing, like phase array radars, antennas for radio telescope, and other things, which are given all the opportunities I'm talking within the field of electromagnetic information theory, which has started to be a discipline per se, by the way. 
Of course, the impact of the, all these kind of electromagnetic information theory, I can list them and uh, I'll do it at the end. It goes, of course, to ultra massive MIMO, holographic MIMO, large intelligent surfaces, and other things like that, which are at the heart of these things. Second thing, also, where we should spend time is on nonlinear signal processing. It's been years, basically, that people have been trying to solve, but today we're starting to have some of, I would say, the small effects on how to move forward on that. So, as I told you before, in optical communication, in wireless, nonlinearities are everywhere. They go from the power amplifiers to the way we transmit. And the way people have been trying to solve these problems are were always by backup. However, there's been some progress that have been made. Typically, my team has been working a couple of years ago on solving the problem of how to communicate in fibers. Fiber is classically the, the system which is known as being nonlinear. And the question is that when you have a nonlinear medium, we know that when it's linear, what you need to use is Fourier type of uh, basis. When it's nonlinear, it was a big problem. Well, in the case of fiber, basically, there's been some progress in what we call the inverse scattering transform. And we were able to build up what we call the nonlinear non -linear Fourier transform and the NFFT, which was basically the kind of precoder and basically equalizer, which was optimum as an eigenfunction function for that kind of system. But that was for a specific design of fiber for which basically the kind of propagation is linked to the, what we call the Schrodinger equation. However, even in linear, I mean, in the wireless, sorry, you have also some major progress which have been made. In the case of MIMO, a couple of papers have appeared using or exploiting what we call the buzzing decomposition in a very specified manner. So when you specify the kind of nonlinearities that you have, I can find you the kind of vegan function. And of course, the second is also done by my ex-PhD student, Jacob Hoydes, who has been working intensively on using AI techniques on replacing the black box of transmission totally and trying basically to learn what are the kind of optimal waveform which can do that. So that also is an approach that you can use. And I think we're only scratching the surface how to do these things. On the case that where you would use AI, I would be less confident on the way you do it. I think we're not exploiting our basic knowledge in that system. And I have a couple of, of papers trying to show that if you do at the same time a merger, what we call data-driven and model-driven approaches, you can improve drastically what you can do. What I mean by that is that we are communication engineers. We have models. They're not so good. We know that. But instead of replacing everything by a black box, what you should do is basically start saying, I will represent that by a neural, ne neural, neural network. However, I have some prior information on some things. And that prior information is that you know the channel, for example. Do you, you know the kind of nodes? But there are nonlinearities that you don't know. And then you can try to combine uh, both. We're not using that approach so far in communication. It's just because it's hard problem. What I mean by hard is that it's not even hard. We're not going outside our comfort zone in the sense that we have some tools which are based on TensorFlow, things like that. And it's very easy to replace everything with those tools to try to learn. Of course, one technique that you could do is that on the, on, on the example that I'm giving here of the communication scheme is to use transfer learning and saying, I have a model of my channel, it's not perfect, but I'll train my neural network by having an initialization in the linear case. And then with the right data of the true system, which is nonlinear, I will retrain my neural network by having an initialization of my neurons or my weights exactly in the linear case. And that already gives you a hit. But what you can do even smarter is to say, I will train my neural network where I have data. And I have, of course, some probability distribution, which I know beforehand of my channel that I would incorporate as prior. And this is basically where a lot of work needs to be done from my point of view. The third one, which I think is also very important to solve the 6G challenges is the signals for time varying channels. So time varying channels has been there for years. I think you're all familiar with the fact that we know when OFDM is optimal and we know when OFDM is not optimal. And today with the kind of, I would say, uh, speed at which we want the system to work, OFDM is not gonna work, we know it. And the main reason is that it dates back to a Shannon paper of 1951, uh, uh, where basically 
it's called communication presence of noise, and where he showcases that basically how you could transmit from one point to the other point when you know the CI side of the transmitter. But today you see that we have a lot of cases which are at the heart of 6G for which OFDM is not optimal. Mobility, the fact that we don't have one band, we have multi bands, where we have five megahertz here, 10 megahertz there. We're dealing also with a lot of, 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 of performance requirements which are different. We're talking about ultra reliable latency. We're not necessarily only interested when we build a waveform on the notion of capacity. We have lots of nonlinearities. The type of channels is very important because the channel that we have is also active. It's not just a passive channel. We have basically uh, active devices like least Reese, which also makes the system nonlinear, and we have coexistence issues. And so, of course, the question is what kind of new waveform you can build on that? So, for each case, there's been some progress, but from my point of view, not a lot. So, in the case, of course, when you're looking at time varying channel, there are already some work which dates from the 60s by uh, Slipion. And the idea of Slipion was, of course, to build basically some waveforms which are uh, 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 basically uh, providing you the ability, sorry, I don't know what's, why it's jumping, which provide you a, a, exactly the eigenfunction function of your system. And he came up with something called the prolite spheroidal wave functions, which are known to be basically uh, uh, eigenfunctions functions of your system. The main reason we didn't use them is basically how you go from the continuous case, just like you, the, the Fourier transform, to the discrete case. But today there's been a lot of constructions on making implementations which are digital of this whole scenario to be able to build these things. And I think uh, this is giving us also a lot of opportunities to go forward. By the way, the people who are working on OTFS are within that category that I put here in terms of how you build those things. The fourth also, I think, big game changer is related to semantic communication theory. Many, uh, I would say, special sessions now are going through. And it goes back to the initial problem I mentioned about what has changed from 1948 to 2022, I put it 2028, because we're talking about the realm here of 60. Well, the first thing when you look at these two models is of course that when you look at the model of Shannon, of course, everything is correct. But now today, things are a bit different because we have, as I told you, memory, and we have also computing capability. This is changing totally the realm of how you communicate because the more you communicate, the less you need to communicate after. Okay, why? Because by storing the past, which was not the case in 1948, you can explode some kind of common understanding between your transmitter and receiver. And at the end, you don't need to exchange anymore the data, you need to exchange only the model. So the person or the device on the other side understands you. This, of course, is something that already Shannon had put forward in his book. Uh, and it's called level B communication, by the way. Level A is what people have been doing for many years. And level B basically is how you transmit basically the meaning because you start building a common understanding is extremely important. How you do it, of course, one option is to use AI technique to build a model. But rapidly people who have been working on the AI realm understood that the kind of neural networks that are exploding have a lot of inconsistencies in doing it. And so now there's a lot of work trying to build some kind of new machine learning techniques to exploit this kind of model that you can build for this kind of common understanding and to move forward. Of course, the big hit in that is basically the compression rate because what you build when you start building models and distributed models between the different entities is that you build a common understanding. And there's many things you don't need to transmit anymore between two devices because it goes to the philosophy that I was mentioning. The more you communicate, the less you communicate after or you need to communicate, which is something also that happens in your daily life. How you build this common understanding, we're only scratching the surface. I have a lot of colleagues in our community who have been working, uh, Professor Mehdi Benis and others, who are, or, or Jean-Claude Belfiore, who's also a very close colleague of mine, looking at different approaches on how to build this common understanding through semantic communication. The other point I wanna mention is basically, and which has a huge impact on localization is super resolution theory. Here again, I think we are quite lost when we look at the KPIs of 6G telling you that you need to have roughly one centimeter localization indoor. 
How can you get that one centimeter is a big question because you can always put that numbers, but we don't know what is the kind of configuration. How many antennas? What is the bandwidth that is required to get one centimeter irrespective of an algorithm? We're talking here about fundamental limits in terms of how you can separate two things in a space. So the question of separating two things in a space or being able to do a super resolution of your environment or being able to discriminate two objects has been already posed by Ernst Abbe and it's called super resolution theory in the field of optics. It has been of course restated differently within a topic called super resolution imaging. And the idea is the same is that what at the end you wanna do is that you have a couple of measurements that you wanna do and you wanna reconstruct the environment. Okay, and reconstruct is re reconstruct your surface because at the end localization is about reconstruction of your signal. Because if you did some measurements at different spots, then you want to localize with a certain precision at the end or with an, with an infinite precision is about reconstructing nearly continuous signal out of a measurement of a discrete signal. This in the case of, uh, of super resolution imaging is known. It's about how you extrapolate a high end spectrum from a low end spectrum. The theory has been there, but only for very specific type of models and in unnoisy cases and not 3D. A lot of work, I think, from my point of view, needs to be done so that we can come up exactly with these fundamental limits in terms of devising how far we could go with the best, basically, algorithm in the world. And then we can let the people working on SAJ with ISPRI, or when I mean SAJ, where ISPRI is new types of SAGE, new types of ISPRI or, or, or types of algorithm, which could achieve those limits. But I think we're not tackling the problem correctly by trying to find algorithms which solve those problems. We should ask ourselves, are those already limits achievable just from a fundamental perspective? The other point I think, which is also quite important and in which we're not putting a lot of time is on multi-agent learning systems. So what is this hype about multi-agent learning systems? Well, the big issue is the fact that today, devices are doing inferences. What I mean by inferences, they want to localize. Localization is inference, by the way. And the big game changer in 6G that we're talking about is not a, anymore about just doing mobile broadband, but it's about inferring. Inferring a lot of the parameters in your network. And that's exactly the kind of connected intelligence that we're building because we want a network which can infer. Now today, what happens is of course, the fact that whatever you, can, you gather, the data you gather, you start sending it to the cloud and in the cloud, basically you start building the kind of model which will do that inference for you. Now we know that we have many constraints on why this is not possible. The first one is privacy. The other is overloading basically your kind of a backhole within the kind of information. The third one is, of course, the fact that it has to be very fast, which is what we call the latency. And the fourth one is the fact that maybe you're not covered. We've been seeing this last year, a lot of manufacturers being able to build chipsets, which can do basically at the same time, uh, learning and inference. And this is a big game changer because we have today the capability of devising a system which is totally distributed on which we can have the same performance as a centralized system in what we're doing in terms of inference. But here again, we have a hard issue in understanding by putting more and more intelligence at the edge, how the system will behave. And I think this is a key problem that we have. On top of that, we have also the issues on how you build these learning mechanisms when you do it at the edge. So on the device for, for information, I worked many years ago with uh, a couple of smart guys in trying to build what we call binary neural networks for that. And binary ne neural networks is exactly the fact that you want to build neural networks on which the weights can take only a low resolution because you're doing it on the device, okay? So at the beginning, when you look at that problem, this is just an anecdote, you think it's a new problem that you're devising. But at the end, what is learning? Learning is just about optimization. When you do optimization in continuous, we all know it's derivative. You optimize, you derive. Derivative is a gradient. That's what people do in classical techniques. Now, if I ask you to do optimization on a system on which your weights can only take values which are binary, then the problem becomes a combinatorial optimization. 
And then the whole, our whole community is extremely well tailored for that because we've been doing combinatorial optimization forever. We've been finding heuristics, which enable us to go from maximum likelihood to things which work quite neatly. And by the way, this is the kind of system that we built with some of my colleagues in terms of building new ways of doing optimization based on decoding structures. And I think this is also a new realm and opportunity for our community to jump in. But here, my question is not just devising that, that was, that was, that was just an anecdote. My main issue here is that we know that we're starting to build more and more intelligent devices. This kind of intelligence at the moment is translated by what we call deep neural networks. And the question we have here today is if each device starts having a local DNA on which you start building a model and you start exchanging, is the system going to behave nicely? Is it going to converge to some kind of inference point on which you're going to do? There, I think we're just scratching the surface. For people who have been building systems based on reinforcement learning, which is one way of doing basically this distributed type, we still have an issue of understanding if the system will converge to one point. The option today that people are looking at is in the large system limit called the mean field scenario and building what we call mean field multi-agent deep reinforcement learning techniques to be able to show the convergence. It's quite reminiscent, by the way, to people who were around 2008, I don't know if there are people in the audience who worked in the community in 2008, on what we call self-organized networks. And in that realm, where the question was not about having a DNN for a reinforcement learning algorithm in each device, it was about what we call having devices which had basically the ability to use techniques based on game theory. And there in the sun real self-organized network, the problem is about having some system which converges to equilibrium. And that we solved by the way, and, uh, uh, and that was solved, I can spend hours explaining that. We solved understanding how the system converged. And basically the big issue that we had at that time for information was mostly about the convergence time and what we call the exploration versus exploitation. Meaning by the time the system started devising some algorithms with feedback, it was too late because you had mobile systems. Today, of course, we're coming back in this realm of AI based on for a simple system for a simple reason is that thanks to the fact that we can store the past and having memory, we can speed up the convergence. And this is why today it's becoming a hot topic. Another important, from my point of view, directions that we're not spending enough time is signals for integrated sensing and communications. So I've been discussing with many colleagues, of course, the big hype as of today for 6G is that one of the things that you wanna do with 6G systems is what we call sensing. Now for sensing, what you need to do is to have a waveform which does not just communicate data, but also plays the role of a radar. But now when you look at what people are doing, they're mostly trying to look at what is the performance of waveforms that we have designed in the past and look how they are adapted to do what we call joint radar and communication. You have a plethora of paper looking at a WebDM and performance in the MIMO CISO setting for doing joint radar and communication. You have a bunch of papers looking at how OTFS would be a good waveform for doing radar and communication. But we never sat down and asked ourselves, let's take the problem from scratch, okay? Fundamental. And ask ourselves if we want to optimize some kind of metric, what is basically the waveform either from, uh, I would say, a theoretical waveform or even a, a numerical waveform we could build that could solve that kind of problems that we have and we can go. And here again, there's a couple of papers which are trying to do that. Another topic which is quite important for me, and I've been working many years on that and haven't found a solution, is basically what we call EE or energy efficiency. I think you're all concerned as of today with the goals that we're having of 6G of reducing basically the amount of energy that is consumed by the network. Many of you also who are familiar with 5G were already implicated in big consortium. One big consortium was called Green Touch. And one of the goal of Green Touch already in 2000, uh, 2010, I'm sorry, was to build by 2010, 2015, a network which could reduce the energy consumption by a factor of 1,000. As you can imagine, in 2015, we were, unable, we were not able to achieve that. That kind of consortium was not a bad thing, by the way. 
Uh, if you look back at history, many of you are, do not realize that, but two technologies emerged from Green Touch. One is called Massive MIMO. And many of you think that Massive MIMO was initially stamped as a technology for broadband. But if you look at the initial presentations of Tom Marzeda already in 2009, which was working intensively in Green Touch, Massive MIMO was considered as the key technology to solve the problem of basically the energy efficiency. Why? Well, in the uplink, by adding more and more antennas, you would reduce basically the power of the devices to transmit. You had a huge radar. And in the downlink, which is obvious, if you have more and more antennas, you can beam form your signal and have exactly the signal transmitted and reduce with a certain backup the energy that is transmitted. Of course, that was on the theoretical wavefront. When you start building the system, I don't have time to talk about it. You had all the RF chains, which turned out to be much more complicated than we thought. But let's say from a fundamental point of view, that was one of the solutions that we were able to build. The second also solution that came in was small cells. Many of you maybe do not recall that, but small cells was one solution to say, well, users are very far from their antennas. This makes users very close to their antennas so that users do not need to transmit with high power to reach that kind of antenna. So what I mean by that is we didn't solve the initial problem of energy efficiency, but that kind of initiative was very, I would say, uh, nice for the whole community because we came up with two technologies which were then used for something else. One is for the more broadband and for small cells. Many of you also uh, know the application that we did. But one thing that we never spend time on is understand what is the fundamental limit? because we can put those 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 fold kind of reduction. But the question is, is it reasonable? What is basically the minimum energy that you need to transmit one bit from one pole to the other pole and from a network? So these kind of course of questions are being asked more and more today. And they're not asked only for the question of communication, but they're also asked for the question of computing. This computing is consuming more and more. And within the 6G realm where we're building a network which connects intelligence, we have much more computing. So there's a nice paper uh, brought up a couple of years ago from my MIT colleagues looking at what we call the carbon footprint. And it's quite impressive when you look at the numbers when we start building models and how it costs us. And so we're doomed to ask basically, from a fundamental point of view, irrespective of the kind of algorithm that we can come up with, what is basically the minimum energy that is needed to compute one bit or to transmit one bit. So these kind of questions tells you to go back to the physics and where you come up with what we call constants, which tells you what is the fundamental limit. I strongly encourage you to look at the work of uh, a guy called Seth Lloyd, but also guys from IBM in the 80s of, of like Bennett, who have already provided some numbers, but for very simple architectures, meaning one TX, one RX, no clue about network, or for, for, them, for very simple computing mechanisms uh, where basically we're looking at more like LN of two joules in terms of computing. Another point also, which, which is very important for us is the unsolved issue of end-to-end -end performance. As you all know, there's been always an issue about what we call cross-layer design, meaning the guys who are doing physical layer they try to work as much as they can by improving basically the performance of the system. And then you have the guys who come on top where they have what we call resource allocation or scheduling mechanisms. And all the small gains that we worked on are erased because we didn't take into account the traffic. And that's because it's two communities which work not closely and have a hard time understanding. The issue of, of, of trying to unify is not new. I'll go faster. The issue of, of, of unifying with the is not new. And there's a very nice paper for the Jubilee of Shannon, I mean, uh, the 50 years of, of, of the 1948 of Shannon, which was published in the, in the Transactions on, on Information Theory, and in which he discussed what he calls information theory and communication network. Here it was more networking, which is called an unconsumed network union and looking at that problem. And the main reason is, of course, that it's hard when you have a problem to decompose it because whenever you start improving one step, in fact, you, you don't do it well. Well, today we have a couple of directions which are quite promising. 
One is a good paper done by Moon Chong Calder Bank a couple of years ago. I mean, even many years ago, where it looks at the problem end to end as a problem of layering as optimization decomposition. Meaning, you take a function and you try to find how to split it optimally, and you start optimizing each one, which is exactly what we want to do. We have uh, the scheduling part. We have the physical layer. It's a joint thing. You want to split it in two, and you want to find what is the kind of minimum exchange that you need to do between both to optimize. And the second, of course, is it goes within the realm of AI, which, as you all know, is a big hype today in looking at what we call not the QoS, but the quality of experience in your, in your transmission. Because of the time I have, I will not spend too much on the three others, which I think are still important. One is related to large-scale communication theory. I think you are all familiar with that. People worked a lot in 5G on NOMA. NOMA was never deployed, and it's still an issue. And we still have no issue on how we can solve the problem of massive access. And I think there, uh, a lot of work promising these last, I would say, years, one or two years ago, where we have now ways of solving the large-scale communication theory approach, not with the grant free, which is one approach, but many others. The second also, which I think uh, has, is unsolved, is the case of non encoded information theory. This is something which was at the heart of ultra reliable low latency communication with all the work of Polyensky and others. And unfortunately for the multi-user case, uh, 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 we're still not finding the way to go forward and how to solve these things. And uh, this is basically in the finite line regime, a big issue. And the last one, which I think is at the heart of our findings is non-current communication theory. And here you have people who have been working on tensor-based type of modulation, grasp and manifold to solve it. So what's the idea, if you're not familiar with non-current communication theory, is why in the hell, when you do transmission, do you do training and then data? We know that it's suboptimal. In fact, it's suboptimal basically when, uh, if you have an infinite block length of transmission, it's optimal. But we know uh, uh, that it's suboptimal for many reasons. And I can give you a reason is if your channel changes every time symbol, okay, then basically using training and the data does not work because you estimate the channel and next time solved, you send the data, but the channel has changed already. However, we know that if we use non current communication, we can transmit by doing an on off king. Either you transmit or you don't transmit. And as a receiver, you have an energy detector. But when you put this in the MIMO setting and stuff like that, things get more complicated. Of course, work has been done with the Grassman tensor-based modulation, and I strongly encourage you to look at things like TBM and other things like that around that. Of course, the challenges were just approaches for the students who are in the audience to conduct the work on their PhD to develop the theories which will serve us for 6G. All these, of course, are translated into what I call here technological challenges. And in which you can see here the majority of keywords and buzzwords on which the community is jumping. And for which, of course, we have already some solutions, but we don't know how far we are from the fundamental limits. This goes from beyond the FDM waveforms to beyond capacity notions like age of information to beyond Shannon semantic communication to beyond MIMO to things that which are at the intersection of OMA and NOMA to build up hybrid analog digital modulation, looking at pervasive AI, polar code, polar code 2.0, timing channels, for example, spatial wave, spatial wave holography, terrorist communication, coded computation, joint sensing and communication, beyond 3D, light of sight, line of sight, millimeter wave communication, sub Nyquist, MIMO architectures, wave focusing, A transceivers, localization, large intelligence surfaces, and chart charting which are, from my point of view, the main features that people are trying to push as of today for 6G. I think now I give you a bit of an overview. But it's a bit fast, uh, but I'm arriving. I want to answer some questions already uh, uh, at 56. But I give you an overview of what I think are the key scientific challenges on which we need to work on so that we can then develop the algorithms. And we're missing that. And from my point of view, the whole academic society that at least is listening to me should spend more time in developing the solutions so that we in the industry could spend more time in developing the engineering approaches for solving those things.
you very, very much for this excellent presentation. And, if and of course, I'm open to answer questions. Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah, first question from me. Yeah. Thank you uh, for the very informative talk. Uh, two questions. The first one is like for the AI part, right? I, uh, are you aware of like systems that are used in currently in practice, like especially like AI in the mobile network operators uh, domain or, you know, so are you aware that the AI parts in use or is just, or are we still in the research? No, it's being used. So two things I worked on. The first one that we developed uh, uh, in my previous company was called AI based voice over LTE. So if you're not familiar with voice over LTE, I am. So, I, 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 yeah, I work so for Cisco systems, so five years, so I kind of know. <laughs> exactly. So for voice over LTE, as you know, is a big problem because improving the quality of voice over LTE is not about just improving the SNR or improving the coverage. It's about the whole end-to-end -end where the servers are. So we've been working and applying that, and you have improvements of 80% to 60% in downing, and that's what made basically a lot of, of operators in moving from a 3G network where you used to use the CS fallback systems, you know, okay. because when you make a call on a, on a 4G, you usually go on a 2G, and yes. it has been used in 4G. The second thing, which is also being used at the moment, is AI-based mass and MIMO. So basically to engineer the kind of beams for a, a, a given uh, situation in an operator, we use this AI-based mass and MIMO technique where we beam for different positions of the users, and then basically when a user is in a new position, we interpolate and find what is the right beam to transmit. Okay, so operators use in current field right now, you're saying? Yes, okay. so the thing which is massively used is AI-based voice over LTE. For AI-based massive MIMO, only some couple of trials. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah the second- Then you have, of course, people, yeah? Yeah, 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 you can go ahead if you- Yeah, then you have, of course, some small trials, that not large-scale trials, in like improving basically the handover, so you can use now AI-based techniques to find what we call the handover threshold. So this is more on a, on a system level uh, perspective. As you know, the, the, the handover threshold is in general fixed. Whenever your signal is higher than this with a certain, I would say, margin, then you change. However, this can be spatial time uh, defined because the handover depends on the traffic that you have. So in some places, they've been using this also. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The second question is like, uh, we have been hearing this quantum communication networks as well, but I not seen in your slides. Uh, do you want to talk a bit on that? Do you see? I can talk possible? about it. I mean, especially as we have a quantum center here. I didn't talk about it because 100% will not make it for 6G. So if you're looking at key scientific challenges for communication, it will make it at one moment. But for 6G, it's not going to happen. Uh, for a simple reason is that the standardization process of 6G is well determined. Uh, as you know, the key technologies need to be developed by 2024. By 2024, 2026, we start doing some kind of, of, of prototyping. And then 2026, the machine starts. So for quantum, it's not going to happen for 6G. However, after, I think it's a good way to go for many things to do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other question from the audience, please? Yeah. So thank you for your talk. Um, so your your talk uh, made me think of um, some work on TCP and congestion control and how uh, that. Uh, like congestion control interacting with variable links creates lots of latency. And uh, you mentioned uh, like um, designing waveforms for low latency uh, communications over links for mobile, for instance. But are you aware of any work on instead of maximizing throughput or minimizing the sort of per uh, transmission latency, instead sort of optimizing the stability of the link so that the higher layers will know where to target for for throughput so that uh, latencies can be brought down on the on the queuing layer yeah so let's say i'm not aware specifically of that however uh the people who are trying to solve that problem today 
So they're not trying to, to, to let's say, uh, localize and trying to solve a part of the thing. Uh, the majority of people that I know are looking at your problem from a black box perspective, meaning they say, okay, I'm looking at the end-to-end -end performance where I incorporate what you're saying, meaning the latency, stability, stuff like that. And basically I will train a lot of data and then input the parameter that I need to solve the end-to-end -end problem. So they look at it as a, a, within, a, a, I would say, a data-driven approach, but not trying to extract and saying, oh, this is the sub part that I need to solve. So this is, of course, uh, doing good. I mean, it works. Uh, not in all the scenarios, because the amount of training that you need to do is too much, because it's related to every configuration you need. And I think this is, in general, the problem of data-driven approaches. Remember the example that I gave you in improving the autoencoder for a point-to-point -point link. Something I mentioned is that to do the training of the waveform for that, you need to do for every kind of channels you have, every kind of link, relay fading, uh, rice channel, this kind of combination. So in general, the data-driven approaches is quite nice when basically you replicate that kind of environment every time. But if you have too much configuration, you spend your time a lot in terms of doing the training. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other question from the audience? Um, maybe online. No. So uh, I have one question. Um, I have two, two questions. So the first one is about the place of Wi-Fi. Uh, we know that uh, there, there are some competition competitions between uh, Wi-Fi and uh, 3G, 4G, 5G, etc. So, what would be the place of uh, Wi-Fi, maybe Wi-Fi 7, etc., in the uh, 6G uh, technology landscape? Yeah. So let's say the following: Wi-Fi, I think, ha was a, is a tremendous success, and it's going to go again and again, and it's going to be improved. And I think uh, it, it's going to be there. One of the things that people need to realize when we talk about um, seller system and especially G is that the people who standardize these things are coming from a communication society and it's 3GPP. The Wi-Fi setting is basically coming from a computer science world, world. One of the things that we have when we go in 3GPP is what we call quality of service, which is extremely important, which you never have basically in Wi-Fi. I don't know the number of PhD committees in which I've been the number of PhD theses which have been writing on doing QoS over Wi-Fi. It never worked. And because it's the best effort. So I think they're complementary, and each one has its time zone or its zone of comfort. So if you're not looking for quality of service, if you're not looking at these constraints, we when we work with operators, if you don't have the QoS, you're dead because you pay huge fine. If some people die because the phone call did not go, then basically you go to jail. You have many cases where operators, when the, the network does not work, people basically emit lawsuits. So this is a big issue. And I think this is the people need to understand between a world of best effort and another world where you need to guarantee basically the quality because you have critical systems going into this. And I think both will survive, both will go because they have also a different kind of of, 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 of uh, requirements they need to solve. There is, of course, a zone where both can compete. And this is, of course, known in the case of broadbands where people would not care of quality of service. And then in that zone, of course, Wi-Fi has all basic its playground to play. And of course, with the fact that also the kind of, of, uh, of cost that you build with Wi-Fi goes down. Thank you very much, Marwan. So my, my second question is about the place of uh, SDN. We know actually that SDN has a good place in, uh, as a core technology uh, in uh, 5G. Uh, is this technology is to remain in uh, 6G or not? I, I think, yeah, I think it will play a big, a big role in, in 6G. I think SDN did not get the whole success it should have in 5G already, you have to know. So, and I think uh, because many people did not really understand the potential of SDN. So there's been much work, but when you think about it, uh, nobody would first understand, understood why would SDN be something specific to 5G? Why you can do it for 5, 4G? 
it took time to understand basically the granularities with which you could come up in terms of improving your system. The second step, of course, this is more personal and where there's a big opportunity in 6G is the players as of today, which are working on 6G are not the classical players that we knew, which are Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia. We have much more players now in the software realm. Apple is coming in, uh, 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 Google is coming in, and other, which want to play more on the software part. And I think this is also one of the main drivers, which will help also this software define whatever you want, happen more and more in the next generation, with also the geopolitics, which is happening today, where there's a catching up of the US and coming up with these uh, more, I would say, ORAN system and going on things. So I think SDN will have a more and more bigger role. Thank you so much, Marwan. So uh, perhaps one last question. Uh, piggybacking on the notion you were mentioning about if quality of service is of issue, then we have to look more to the cellular backbone that will provide it. But many of the younger researchers also looking at non-critical applications involving IoT and so on, now are seeing uh, maybe a bit of a turf war. You remember for the longest time, Bluetooth was the de facto standard for, you know, um, low power communication, for example, and now with Wi-Fi 802.11, AH and other standards, including, you know, Wi-Fi, LoRaWAN and so on, uh, that turf has been changing significantly. So what is kind of your view, especially in terms of advising our younger, you know, researchers going into this field um, in terms of, you know, low power, long range or short range communication for non-critical applications? What domains should they explore as they build on that? Yeah, so that's not an easy question. I think in all these things, it's always the question of finding the right use case on which we can develop things uh, and make sense. Uh, I told you the, the reasons in, the, in this 3G is the requirements of quality of service. In the case of what you're saying of these IoT, low power stuff, there's a lot of big opportunities around that. I have to confess that uh, cellular IoT and all this IoT is not making its time yet. Uh, and I think uh, the main reason is that the classical players doesn't, do not have a good understanding on how to exploit that to the maximum, okay? Uh, and again, give you a very good example, 5G. Today, people talk about 5G, but when you look at 5G, the only thing which is deployed today is the mobile broadband uh, uh, scenario 5G. Ultra-reliable low latency is not, and uh, massive connectivity is not. The main reason is not because they don't want to. We don't know how to make money out of it. Nobody knows how to sell subscription based on ultra reliable low latency or subscription related to massive connectivity, which are twits. And I think this will happen. I mean, we know who's going to make money. Of course, it's like before. Before it was the OTT way for 4G, which were making money. And today it's the people who, of course, do machine learning out of the data that you have behind which are not exactly the, 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 the seller ones. So we're having a shift for 4G, which was OTT, Netflix, and others. And today we know who are the players are gonna do. So I think what needs to be done here is that there's a lot of potential, but there's a lot of thinking also on the use cases and, and how you can basically generate businesses out of these things, which I think we didn't spend time enough for 5G. Nobody's in a rush today to deploy uh, uh, mass, uh, mass MMTC, for example. When you talk to people, operators, they're not in a rush. Let's take our time. Why should we do it? I mean, if we deploy and, and make it, who's gonna make money out of it? Absolutely. Well, with that, yeah. Um... Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Mervan Depa. Uh, please well, um, join me to thank very much uh, Professor Thank you. I hope I can come next time. Uh, uh, we sent you a private message uh, later. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you.